Uh, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. As you can see, the title of my talk today is Religion and the Rule of Law, but monetary policy and the rule of law would also have been an equally good title. I think since the financial crisis of 2007 and 2001, the sort of intuitively grasp that something isn't quite right with our money, uh, money and banking arrangements in the United States and perhaps even the entire Western world. And so this talk really represents my attempt to wrestle with this question and come to an answer of what I think is wrong with our monetary institutions and what can be done to fix them so as to mitigate the pernicious effects of the business cycle in the future. But before we talk about monetary policy, we need to talk about money. In particular, we need to explore a little bit the essence and the economics of money. In its essence, money is a medium of exchange. All money is, is a good that we use to trade for other goods. When you sell your labor, you get a wage, you get money. You turn around and use that money to buy other stuff that you want in the marketplace. We see here there's an inherently social feature of money. We use it to trade with other people. Now, if you read a macroeconomics textbook, this will be one feature of money that you come across. There's two others. One, money as a store of value, a way of holding on to purchasing power over time. And two, a unit of account, a sort of common denominator in which prices, which are just exchange ratios for various kinds of services, are posted. These other two functions are important. They should be paid attention to. But for the purposes of this talk, I really want to focus on money as a medium of exchange because that's where all the interesting economic phenomena are going to lie. Where does money come from? Really, there's two views of the ancestry of money. One is that money is the creation of wise philosopher kings. Way back in barter, we had barter economies, pretty inefficient. Some really clever guy comes along and says, hey, what if we tried money? And presto change of money appears. The other view is that money is a spontaneous order, it's an evolved feature that people gradually learn how to use as they trade with each other. This was the view of the famous Austrian economist Karl Menger in his 1892 essay on the origins of money, and it's the view that the economic profession, a majority of the economic profession, I should say, accepts as the origin of money. But it wasn't the creation by any one individual or group, it was the gradual result of individuals trading with each other and then learning, hey, some goods are easier to trade than others. So I'm going to trade for those easier to trade goods and then turn around and use those to trade for what I finally want to consume. The more people do that, the more the intermediate good becomes valuable as a medium of exchange. We get a snowballing effect and eventually we come from a blunder economy to a monetary economy. What are the advantages of the monetary economy over barter? Well, one, as I mentioned already, barter's pretty costly. Not only do I have to find someone who's selling me something that I want, but if I live in a barter economy, they also have to want what I have. This is called the double coincidence of wants problem. Notice that if we live in a money-using economy, that problem goes away. All I have to do is find someone who's willing to trade me for money, and then since everyone by definition accepts money, otherwise it wouldn't be money, I turn around and use the money to buy what I want. So that economizes on the line of what we call the search costs, the resources that you would have to use in fighting the trading partner. Now those resources can be put to better uses now that we're in a monetary economy. Just as important, and really as a consequence of the former, I think, we have now a common denominator for comparing the viability of various lines of production. You're a farmer, you grow wheat, you trade your wheat in a barter economy for three yards of rope and some eggs. Have you made a profit? The question doesn't really make any sense, does it? Because there's a different exchange ratio for every good against every other good. The exchange ratio of wheat to rope. The exchange ratio of rope to eggs, vice versa. Now that we have money, we have a unit in which we can compare various economic activities. The value of my resources is X dollars. I produce wheat. Now the value of my resources is Y dollars. Is Y bigger than X? If so, I've made a profit, added value to society's scarce resources. Is Y less than X? In which case, I made a mistake. I've inadvertently destroyed value. Notice before we had money, we would have no way of making that calculation. But now, all of a sudden, we have a way of comparing the viability of the various production processes. And that means that markets themselves are going to take on some pretty nice properties that economists like to pay a lot of attention to. Now that we're in a money using economy, we can actually start taking advantage of economic accounting, profit and loss calculation. 
This is really important because profit and loss calculations are the means by which individuals and the businesses which they take part in actually communicate information with each other in the marketplace. In particular, the price system, the entire constellation of relative prices of goods and services denominated in money conveys essential information about which production projects are actually social ben socially beneficial and which ones are not. The price system is how we coordinate our economic activities with each other. To see this, let's go briefly through the three roles that the price system performs in market economies. On the one hand, we have the role of prices ex ante. I'm thinking about opening a bakery. I observe the market prices of things like flour and butter and sugar and eggs and space to house a business, to rent a mixer, etc. I compare that to the market price of things like cookies and cakes and other things that bakers make. To the extent that my outputs can sell for more than my inputs, that's a pretty good indication that if I become a baker, I can make a profit. That's good for me because it means that I get money. That's good for society because it means that you've added value to society's scarce resources and created something that individuals are voluntarily willing to trade for. Now that's the role of the price system ex ante. It's forward looking. We can also talk about the role of the price system ex post, after the fact. Now that I've actually opened my bakery, did I get it right? Maybe my input costs were higher than I expected and I could sell my cookies for less than I expected. I thought I could make a profit by opening a bakery, but in fact, I'm making losses. That means that even though I thought I was right, I was in fact wrong, and I'm inadvertently destroying the value of society's scarce resources. But notice that without profit and loss, I wouldn't even have that information. Now that I have accounting, now that I have money that I can do common economic accounting with, I can actually see, gee, I'm making a loss. Either what I'm making people don't want, or I need to change how I make cookies to embrace cheaper production technology to give people that thing that they want for what they're willing to pay and can afford. So that's the ex ante rule of prices and the ex post rule of prices. But we can also talk about the role of prices in entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is inherently creative, it's imaginative, it's the bringing into existence of new ideas new production technologies, new ways of doing things. The creation of the Model T in a world where we all went around by horse and buggy is an act of entrepreneurship. Henry Ford presumably compared the cost of his inputs to what he thought people were going to pay for his cars. That's an act of production just like any other, but we can't divorce it from the imaginative and creative element. Something like that hadn't really been seen before in the world, and it completely changed the way in which economic communities were formed and were located to each other. But nonetheless, market prices denominating money were crucial for giving Ford the information he needed to ascertain, hey, is there a market for this model T contraption? Turns out there is. How do we know? Markets in the price system. So what we see with this is that market prices freely adjusting in response to supply and demand is how we coordinate markets. Quantity supply tends toward quantity demanded as prices adjust, the plans of consumers Meshes help with the plans of producers. Producers make stuff that consumers want and sells it to them at prices they can afford. That's what we mean when we say market coordination. A famous economist once said that economics is really the mystery of how the city of Paris gets fed, even though nobody who lives in the city of Paris really is a farmer. How does all the food get to where it needs to go? How is it distributed efficiently? The answer is all that economic activity is coordinated by the market price system and as the source of the prosperity that we all really take for granted. So money and money prices will form a very, very valuable service to us. But, and there's always a but, isn't there? Now we're prepared to understand one peculiar feature about money. Markets work well because they're coordinated. They're coordinated because of the money price system. Prices are exchange ratios denominated in money. The price of apple is denominated, the price of an apple rather, is denominated in some independent good. What is that good? The dollar. But what's the price of a dollar? Here we encounter a slight problem because we realize that money has no market in which it is independently priced. Apples have a market in which they're independently priced. They're priced in terms of dollars. But what are dollars priced in terms of? There is a supply of dollars, there is a demand for dollars. 
but there's no other market from which dollar pricing can take place in the same way as Apple pricing can take place. So the only meaningful way to talk about the price of dollars is to flip around the prices that we normally talk about. When we talk about the price of apples, we're talking about the dollar price of apples. When we flip that ratio on its head, we arrive at the apple price of dollars, the goods price of money. So the price of money is really related to its purchasing power, right? the inverse of all the ordinary prices that we encounter in the marketplace. That's really the price of money. Think of all the various goods that you can consume in your daily routine. Right? $5 for a meal, $10 for a meal, whatever it is that you pay, $15 for a new jacket. Flip all those around and you get all of a sudden a price of money, a weighted average of all those things, which is really different for each individual. We typically express that index in terms of what's called a price level, more on that in a bit, and sort of a way of getting at the purchasing power of the money in general. But since money doesn't have this other market, in which case it's priced, in which it's priced, I should say, the only way for the market for money to be coordinated is if all the relative prices all throughout the economy adjust, such that the amount of money individuals demand to hold as cash balances equals its supply. When that condition holds, markets can do their magic. The market price system will accurately convey, convey information about relative resource scarcities, and markets more or less work higher than common 101 textbook says. If the money market is not well coordinated, if there's not enough money in the economy to satisfy, satisfy people's demands for it, or if the supply of it is too high relative to individuals' demands for it, then we have what are called macroeconomic problems. Eventually, those things will work themselves out. Excess demands for and excess supplies of money are temporary phenomena. And the problem will go away. But in the meantime, the problem can cause some difficulties for us that we'd rather avoid if we can. If there's an excess demand for money, people are trying to build up their cash balances, which means that you're going to see a, total, a drop in total spending in the economy, which could be accompanied by a recession. On the other hand, if there's too much money in the economy, then individuals are going to try and spend down those cash balances to get rid of that extra money and trade it for something they'd rather have. If everybody does that, you get inflation, a fall in the purchasing power of money. So monetary equilibrium, the condition in which money markets are coordinated, is sort of the sweet spot. And at that spot, the market price system will work well. If we're not at that spot, really the thing we need to do is figure out how to get as close to that spot as possible. Money is governed by institutions. The production of money doesn't just happen out of thin air. Some organization or group of organizations is responsible for producing money under a given set of rules. Markets as a whole, all social institutions really are governed by rules for deciding who gets what and when. Money is no different. So the question is, if we're looking for monetary equilibrium, if we're looking for a well-functioning money market such that we don't get recessions on the one hand or excess inflation on the other, we should be looking for institutions, i.e. social rules, that give people good incentives for producing the right amount of money. So the question is, what are those monetary institutions that we currently have? What do they look like? In pretty much every Western country today, that monetary institution is a central bank. A central bank is the organization uniquely responsible for determining the amount of money in the economy. Now, I should be careful and say that central banks are uniquely responsible for determining the amount of base money in the economy. If you take more economics classes, you'll learn that there are various measures of the money supply. The banking system creates money as the course of its ordinary operations, but the ultimate background condition on which banks operate is determined by central banks. So we can say meaningfully that the central bank is sort of the decider of last resort for how much money there is in the economy and whether or not we are currently in a situation of monetary equilibrium or if we have a recession or if we have excess inflation. So, the track record of central banks, how well they perform. Central banks are organizations that have a monopoly on the creation of fiat-based money. Nobody else can create this money. Only central banks are allowed to. So it would be beneficial if we could scrutinize them to see how good a job have they done. Central banking is comparatively new in human history. 
especially as it is practiced now, geared toward uh, toward active towards active macroeconomic management. So let's look at the track record. How well have they done? I could spend a lot of time going over the historical detail on this. I'll instead give you the short answer: not great. Central banking has not done a very good job compared to previous historical monetary institutions at maintaining monetary equilibrium and fighting on the one hand recession, uh, recessions and on the other hand in inflation. I'm going to focus on the U.S. Federal Reserve because that's the case I know best. Compared to the pre-Fed period, Federal Reserve was created in 1913 by an act of Congress, compared to the uh, pre-Fed period, the United States has actually increased, uh, experienced greater macroeconomic instability. The variance of variables that we care about, like GDP and inflation, are higher in the post-Fed period than in the pre-Fed period. Now, a lot of scholars point to that and say, yeah, but that includes the Great Depression, and the Great Depression is kind of an outlier. Admittedly, the central bank didn't do a great job in the Great Depression, but the institution was young, we were still learning, and if you filter out the Great Depression, really, they, everything's on you Not quite. Admittedly, if you take out the Great Recession, the record is better for central banking, but even then, it's ambiguous. Again, this is the dominant monetary institution of the modern world. It exists pretty much in every Western country in this form. You would think that if it's such a huge improvement, given that most economists think that central banking is the greatest thing since sliced bread, that it would have an unambiguous historical record. The truth is, it doesn't. And I want to focus a little bit more on one policy instance that I think we can indict the Federal Reserve on, and that is the Great Recession. I think we can indict the Central Bank of the United States on two margins with respect to the Great Recession that started in 2007 and 2008. First, I think you can indict them for creating the economic conditions in which the asset boom occurred in the first place. In other words, due to monetary policy, interest rates were kept too low for too long. Credit was artificially cheap. That created a bubble which would have to burst. Afterwards, afterwards, after the bubble had burst, the Federal Reserve did not do enough to stabilize the economy. So they messed up before, and they messed up after, at least I thought. To make that case, I want to show you two graphics, the before case and the after case. So this is a graph of the actual interest rate that the Federal Reserve targets compared to what is called the Taylor Rule interest rate. That just basically means a hypothetical interest rate that should prevail on the market if money markets are well behaved. Now, I should say that the relationship between monetary policy and interest rates is very complex. It is not always the case that excessively loose monetary policy means low interest rates. But in the short run, all else being equal, central banks can, again, only in the short run, diverge, i.e. push down the market rate of interest from what it should be to coordinate the plans of savers and investors. And that's what we observed starting in the early 2000s. The Federal Reserve overreacted to economic levels lingering over from the dot-com boom, it stepped on the gas, it expanded the money supply, channeled that money into credit markets, and that created a condition that was conducive to a speculative bubble. That's only one part of the story. You still need to explain why that excess liquidity went into housing. And to tell that story, you need to talk about federal housing policy. Right? So this isn't the whole story, it's only part of the story. But I think it's an important part because it tells you that we have the conditions necessary for an unsustainable asset boom in the first place. And I think we can lay that at the Federal Reserve's feet. Next, we have the problems after the fact. So that graph that you see on the board now is the U.S. nominal GDP gap. Nominal GDP just means the total dollar value at current prices of all newly produced goods and services in the economy. Roughly, maintaining economic, uh, maintaining economic stability means maintaining a trend growth rate of NGDP. Now, since NGDP is constructed using current market prices, which depends on the current money supply, and the Federal Reserve controls that, not completely, but has fairly good control over that, if there's a sudden and unexpected drop, followed by not being caught up to the original trend path, that is almost by definition the fault of the central bank. So I would argue that the Federal Reserve was far too easy on credit and monetary policies in the year running up to the crisis, and a little bit 
too eager to not step on the gas after the crisis. So they really missed it going both ways. I think that explains why we had an asset bubble, why it burst, and furthermore, why we didn't have a strong, robust, and swift recovery. If I'm right, that's a pretty serious indictment of monetary institutions. So, here's the puzzle we need to work out. If you talk to a central banker, you will discover very quickly that A, they are incredibly smart, and B, they are incredibly well-intentioned. These are people with degrees from the most prestigious economic programs. They have CVs a mile long of scholarly research papers in monetary economics. They truly are committed towards stewarding the health of the economy as a whole. Given these people are incredibly intelligent and are in possession of uncommon integrity, how do we explain these results? I suggest that the only way we can explain these results is by suggesting that the game itself, so to speak, is rigged. The institution of central banking as it currently exists cannot deliver on what it promises because it is unconstrained by any sort of rules. The problem isn't necessarily just uh, central banking. It is discretionary central banking. No hard and fast rules binding the hands of the monetary authority, which gives them structure, gives their conduct some sort of order and links it to an underlying conception of economic stability. This is also a problem for another reason, and now I'm venturing slightly out of technical macroeconomics and getting more on now to political philosophy and jurisprudence. The idea of a government under law the idea of being ruled by laws rather than the arbitrary whims of men is central to Western jurisprudence. <clears throat> what we come from with this, uh, from this intuition is the idea that there are certain institutions and practices that the public authority may not trespass on unless it has a really, really, really good reason. <clears throat> One of those is the institution of private property. The government is not or ought not be allowed to arbitrarily redistribute property. Again, subject to the constraint of unless there's a really, really good reason. Well, the monetary relationships that exist between people is many things. One of them is a property relationship. Think about the relationship between creditors and, creditors and debtors. If a central bank unexpectedly creates inflation, that basically changes de facto the terms of a loan. If you borrow money and there's unexpected inflation, you're paying back that loan in depreciated money. That's taking wealth from the creditor and giving it to the lender. So by having a monetary policy that is not lawful, and that's just one example, but in the interest of time, I want to make sure that we get more to the main one of the talk. By having a monetary policy that is not governed by law, we basically have an example of one of the most important social institutions operating outside the umbrella that is central to Western jurisprudence, or at least has been since the Enlightenment. I think that that poses serious ethical problems in addition to the standard macroeconomic technical issues. So the question is, if we want to bring monetary policy under the rule of law, we need to find some alternative way of ordering monetary institutions such that we have a stable, predictable, and non-discriminatory monetary regime. All three of those words have a very specific meaning, and I want to get into what those concepts mean a little bit before I talk about how they would apply to money and monetary policy. So I'm now making an appeal to the classically liberal tradition of governance that has characterized Western jurisprudence for, you can still find themes of that in uh, Western jurisprudence today, even though I wouldn't say the current governance institutions are very classically liberal. But nonetheless, our intuitions about what public authorities can and cannot do ought and ought not do, and under what conditions they can do it, I would argue, are traceable back to the, these three criteria. When we talk about some institution that is to be brought under the umbrella of the rule of law, we're saying three things. One, that that institution should not be characterized by privilege. The word privilege is composed of a Latin root. It literally means private law. One law for me, another law for thee. You can understand why that would be worrying to people who are worried about a uniform rule of law in a policy. If one group of people is playing by one set of rules and another group of people is playing by a different set of rules, then it's pretty easy to advantage one, to put one group an advantage over another. That strikes us as wrong. We don't want to do that. We want one law to prevail for different individuals in the, in the interest of fairness. We also want our institutions to be predictable. In other words, 
when like cases come up, when situation A happens, if that under institution X has a result Y, we would hope that the uh, that under the condition of another similar situation arising, it would be judged and dealt with the same way. It's another way of saying that we basically can expect, if we find ourselves in the situation to be governed by this institution, we know the rules by which it will operate. That's important because it helps us anchor our expectations about the future. Think about how hard it would be to trade in the marketplace, for example, if instead of a stable rule of law with respect to property, some authority can basically redistribute property any time it wanted for no good reason. Nobody would have any incentive to produce any wealth because they might have it stolen from them. Predictability is an equally important uh, feature of monetary institutions as well. Lastly, we want our institution to be non-discriminatory. We don't want one group to be able to lose it at the expense of other groups. To give you a sort of idea of where we're going, we don't want monetary institutions such that Goldman Sachs gets special access and everybody else doesn't. Right? That's one thing that many people were complaining about in the aftermath of the financial crisis. It may or may not be a fair characterization, but nonetheless, it does strike us all as at least somewhat obvious that different financial institutions are using current, people, uh, current monetary institutions to benefit themselves and passing the cost of that onto the rest of us. Ideally, a monetary institution under the rule of law would not do that. So again, central banking, I think the historical record shows, has a reasonable claim to upholding generality, but has done a very bad job at maintaining predictability and a very bad job of fighting privilege. I'm sorry, predation. The purchasing power of the dollar at frequent times has been unpredictable. The stance of monetary policy is really hard to understand. The decision process is opaque. No one really knows how the Federal Reserve makes its decisions. And again, depending on if you're a too big to fail institution or some important financial organization, it seems like you get to play by different rules. I would argue that this is unacceptable for as fundamental social a relationship as a money. So hopefully I've convinced you that this is worth taking a harder look at and perhaps postulating some alternatives to central banking, or at least central banking as it currently exists. So, let's bring our analysis of the rule of law specifically to monetary institutions. There's a lot of information on this slide. In the interest of time, I'm simply going to mention the first one. There was a famous problem in macroeconomics called the time inconsistency problem which is just fancy speak for, even in a perfect world, central banks have an incentive to create too much inflation. Even if you assume that both the central bank and the public are 100% fully informed and fully rational, and that the central bank is 100% perfectly benevolent, all they care about is the public welfare, even then, central banks have an incentive to create too much inflation. Why? The short answer is they want the public to be as happy as possible, the public likes goods and services, but doesn't like inflation. And so the central bank says, hey, we'll promise a low inflation rate, we promise. And after they fool the public into believing that they're not going to print up a bunch of money, they then print up a bunch of money. And in the short run, you can get not only low inflation and high production, but provided that the public still believes you, you can continue to get that. But of course, the public isn't stupid. They know that the Federal Reserve has an incentive to tell them a little bit of a lie in their own best interest, of course. And so they don't believe them. And that lack of belief between the two guys in the game, so to speak, the central bank and the public, creates its own economic problems. Now, that's in a first best world. Again, that's in a world where the central bank has everything going for it, and the public has everything going for it. When we realistically include incentive and information frictions, when we look at the real world and we realize, hey, members of the public are not fully benevolent, and maybe, just maybe, our decision makers aren't robots, but actual people who make mistakes from time to time. So how should our monetary policy work in that kind of a world? Proposal number one, to cope with information and incentive problems in the provision of money. Some scholars have proposed what is called a monetary constitution. Now the word constitution means something very specific in economics and political economy. Most people see the word constitution and they think, oh, the Constitution of the United States. So you want an amendment to the Constitution that specifies some monetary policy. That's one solution, perhaps, but that's not what we're talking about. In economics, 
Constitution simply means the rules for rulemaking. What is a government? An organization that makes rules. What is the Constitution? Any set of rules, whether formal or informal, whether written down, as in the case of the United States, or existing in a body of precedent, as in the case of the United Kingdom, that dictate the rules for changing the rules. That's what a Constitution is, just a set of meta rules. And so when we say we want a monetary constitution, what we mean is we want to give the central bank a rule for its behavior that dictates to the central bank what it has to do that the central bank cannot itself change. That the central bank cannot itself change. You'll find many monetary economic scholars who say, yeah, monetary rules, I'm great. Just have the central bank announce, oh, I'm going to increase the money supply by 2% every year. Well, that works up until the central bank wants to do something else. There needs to be some binding authority holding the central bank to truly lawful conduct. And that's what we mean by a monetary constitution. Now, there is a danger here, because this is all sufficiently abstract that we're not yet thinking about how we would actually get this if we wanted it. If we did want it, it would almost certainly involve the assertion of some congressional authority over the Federal Reserve. The Fed was created by Congress. Presumably, the Congress could reassert authority once again if it wanted to. But perhaps the only thing worse than monetary policy conducted by unaccountable central bankers is monetary policy under the control of election uh, politicians on short-term election cycles. You do not, 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 not want politicians on short-term election cycles in control of the money supply. That is a recipe for perpetual high inflation right before every election. Oh look, I'm up for re-election. Better give the economy a tune-up. Hey Fed, print some money. Repeat as elections come up, ad infinitum. Right, so if you actually wanted to make any progress on this front, you would have to do it in such a way that monetary policy decisions could not be politically pressured by elected representatives. And that's really hard to do. But nonetheless, we can still talk about what this would mean in theory, and that's important because it tells us what options are on the table. So, saying that there should be a rule handed to the central bank that it itself cannot change is one thing. It's another thing to say, this rule in particular. What are the costs and benefits of various rules? I think we can talk about that a little bit. One popular one is a zero inflation rule. The Federal Reserve should be handed a rule saying you will stabilize the purchasing power of the dollar. If there's inflation today, you'll undo it tomorrow. If there's deflation today, you'll undo it tomorrow. We don't want the purchasing power of the dollar to change. We want it to be a firm measuring rod. It's independent of time that we can use to track economic value. There's some attraction to that. We can see why we might want a stable dollar in terms of purchasing power. If the value of the dollar is stable over long periods of time, you don't have to worry about writing in expected inflation or expected deflation into your financial contracts. A lot of people are surprised when they learn that in the days when railroads were first being built from one end of the country to another, railroads would frequently issue 100-year bonds. They would borrow money on a 100-year time period. Why was that feasible? Answer, the dollar was still on a gold standard. So it wasn't feasible for there to be significant inflation or deflation over that time period. You had a pretty good expectation that so long as the dollar was on the gold standard, a dollar today would be the same thing as a dollar 100 years from now. Now you don't need gold to do that. You could just tell the central bank, hey, stabilize the value of the dollar. Whatever it is today, that's what's staying at. That's gonna be our monetary rule. Now the pros of that, is that that would be very easy to implement with existing monetary institutions. You wouldn't even have to change the composition of the Federal Reserve. You could just have someone say, Fed, your new rule is to stabilize the purchasing power of the dollar. Go do it. But of course, there are costs as well. The costs, and one cost that is particularly salient, I feel, is that there are actually situations where, from the standpoint of economic efficiency, want the purchasing power of dollar, the dollar to change. If, for example, oil unexpectedly drops to $10 a barrel, you would want the purchasing power of the dollar to change in response to that. That's an example of what we call a supply shock. It drives productivity shifts in the economy. And if the purchasing power of the dollar is not allowed to change to accommodate, accommodate that, you end up overstimulating the economy in good times. 
and then overly putting on the uh, overly pushing on the brake pedal on bad times. So if there was a negative productivity shock, you would actually amplify that to the worst. And if there was a positive productivity shock, you would actually amplify that to the worst. It's sort of the Goldilocks rule. You don't want it too cold, you don't want it too hot, you want it just right. You can't do that if you have a stable purchasing power of the dollar. That's the cost. Is it worth the trade-off? Reasonable people can disagree, but we gotta be clear on exactly what we're signing up for. Another example of a monetary constitution would be a return to some sort of commodity standard, a gold standard perhaps. Define the dollar as a certain weight of gold. The dollar is just X ounces of gold. That's what the dollar is. That's one way, in addition, of stabilizing the purchasing power of money. Another nice thing about this is that it introduces some nice self-correcting tendencies into the market for money. Assuming that you had some government branch responsible for buying and selling gold for the given dollar exchange rate in an unlimited amount to maintain the peg, to the extent that the dollar price of gold diverts from the peg ratio, there would be natural market self-correcting tendencies that would be introduced to push it back towards that number. We can talk about that a little bit more in the Q&A. The basic logic for the way that works, though, is that we're actually using some market mechanisms, arbitrage, supply and demand, to keep the purchasing power of the dollar at the, at the tech level, if we're pegging it to gold. Now the cons. Whatever commodity we peg the dollar to, we are necessarily going to introduce productivity factors for that commodity affecting the purchasing power of the dollar. So, for example, if gold mining technology radically and unexpectedly improves overnight and we're on a gold standard, then there's going to be an extra influx of gold into the economy. And remember, since gold is dollars, that's going to create inflation. Likewise, if for some reason a natural disaster strikes and wipes out half of our gold mining capability, that's going to reduce the flow of gold coming into the United States, coming in and affecting prices which means that prices are going to rise less quickly than expected and might even fall, we might even have deflation. So by pegging the dollar to any specific commodity, it doesn't matter what that commodity is, you're necessarily introducing into the purchasing power of the dollar factors that affect the productivity technology of that commodity. If it's gold, it's gold. If it's silver, it's silver. It doesn't matter what it is. So again, we can debate the pros and cons of that, but what I want to talk about is what is perhaps the most radical alternative to currently existing monetary institutions. And this one's my personal favorite. What I would actually propose is a complete separation of money and state. In other words, I would argue that money be privatized and that we embrace what is called laissez-faire or free banking. This is not just pie-in-the-sky idealism. The system that I envision has actually existed and worked quite well in various historical time periods. Time period one would be 18th and early 19th century Scotland. Time period two would be Sweden in the latter part of the 19th century. And then time period three would be, surprise, Canada for its entire history pretty much up until the First World War. Our partners to the north have basically for the entire history of their country had more sensible money and banking policies than the United States has had. Anyone care to name how many banks failed in Canada during the Great Depression? Zero banks. Thousands and thousands of bank failures in the United States during the Great Depression. Zero in Canada. That's not due to luck. Question? Yeah, but when, during the Great Depression, did Canada confiscate all the gold as like FDR did during the Great Depression? I don't think they ever did that, did they? Well, the FDR made it illegal to own an ounce of gold. Yes, he did. What was that, 33? 1933. 1933. I'd love to talk more about that in the Q&A, because that also obviously affects monetary relationships. The dollar was on a gold standard. The government was trying to push it off a gold standard. So we need to talk about the dynamics of that, especially in a world where private individuals are still holding gold and might use it for monetary purposes. So how does this free banking system work? Basically, Money is privately created by banks. When you hold on to money, especially from the latter, uh, United States, from the latter part of the 19th century, or the early 20th century, what you are holding is a bank note. What you are holding is a debt instrument, an IOU, printed by the bank for you. So when you hold a bank's money, what you're basically doing is loaning them money. 
you're giving them purchasing power and allowing banks to perform the role as financial intermediaries. Banks take deposits, people's savings, and then loan them out for mortgages, for business construction, etc. That's what we mean when we say that banks are financial intermediaries. They link up savers with investors, and thereby put scarce capital to its most effective use. So in a world where we have some outside commodity as money, gold perhaps, what banks will do is print up a bunch of notes and issue them saying, here's a note drawn on the Bank of Bob. You can bring this note to the Bank of Bob, and the Bank of Bob will, if you so choose, redeem it for X amount of gold, where X is the number printed on the bank note. In that system, it turns out, as it existed historically, most people used for their daily money needs banknotes. You didn't see people carting around bullion and trading with each other. They used banknotes. Sometimes they actually wrote checks on their deposits. So even though money was redeemable in gold, but actually traded hands were the banknotes. And gold, or gold and silver, if you're not on a bimetallic standard, would only be withdrawn from the system in unusual circumstances. What does that mean? Put yourself in the perspective of a profit-maximizing bank. Imagine that the demand to hold your notes rises. First of all, how do you know that? Well, you know that because you're keeping track of how much gold is flowing out of your bank every week. If that number goes down, that's basically the public telling you they want to hold more of your notes. They're giving you a zero interest loan. If you're a profit maximizing bank, what do you do? Print up a bunch of new notes and spend them. Money demand rises, money supply rises to meet it. Monetary equilibrium is maintained. What if money demand falls? People are going to be redeeming yeah. notes. Either they're going to be redeeming gold out of the banking system, or what's more common, rival banks are going to come up and say, hey, in the course of business, we've accumulated a bunch of your notes and we'd like gold now, please. So you're going to see yourself, the Bank of Bob, losing gold more than expected. And so you think to yourself, I better tone it back. I better call in some loan to shore my portfolio. Money demand falls, money supply falls, monetary equilibrium is maintained. What we are doing is fully unleashing the incentive aligning information generating properties of a market economy and applying it to money itself. It can work because historically it has worked. All it takes is one white raven to disprove the claim that all ravens are black. What's important here is that money is also institutionally governed. This only works in societies where you have private property rights, a firm and non discriminatory rule of law, and contract enforcement. Without those things, you don't get these nice results. So provided you have those things, a fully private monetary system is, in fact, feasible. Again, only provided that you have those things. How we get there from here, even if we wanted to, is anybody's guess. And I think that I would be understating my case if I said, this is not exactly a politically powerful recommendation. But nonetheless, I believe it is important to suggest it precisely because, A, historically it's worked, and B, not a lot of people know about it. And I think they should, because it's served many countries well for many, many years. And I think that this, in its ideal form, is what a monetary system, a monetary institution, would look like in a society of free men.